News in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Wednesday, April 14th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 10 degrees, and here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. A rollover trapped a vehicle driver late last night, causing significant damage to a house in Elmvale Acres. Police later confirmed the person in the car was pronounced dead at the scene. Firefighters were called to extricate that person from the vehicle. What appears to be a quiet residential neighborhood in Ottawa, Elmvale Acres in the Smyce saint laurent area, is anything but, according to this area resident, Mike. It's no surprise because the speeding is ridiculous here. And we've been after our councillor for years to do something about it and nothing. Mike says the street was just repaved last year. In fact, new sewer lines were installed at the same time a request for things like speed bumps or traffic calming was put in to the councillor. And Mike says that was ignored. City News Time 901, and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. We are in for another day with temperatures well above average. The high 18 degrees, the average high is about 11. Sunny breaks, some showers at times, and then more showers overnight, 6 for the low. Tomorrow, rain, 15 to about 20 millimeters, the high near 11. For today, the high 18. And right now in both Ottawa and in Smith Falls, it's 10 degrees. Five Ottawa City Councillors are voicing opposition to the possibility of an 8 p.m. curfew at Ottawa City Parks as suggested by the Mayor. It's going to be part of the discussion today at Ottawa City Council. Here's City News reporter Eric O'Brien. Ottawa City Councillors Catherine McKenney, Jeff Leeper, Ralston King, Matthew Fleury and Sean Menard sent a joint letter to Ottawa's Mayor Jim Watson opposing the idea of a curfew and asking that the Mayor accepts that the matter be discussed publicly at Council. Speaking on behalf of the group, Councillor McKenney says they didn't want the curfew to be imposed without discussion. We want to be able to have that public discussion and, and hear from the expert. You know, it really is taking away enforcement from the behavior that's causing the problem and instead, you know, policing residents who uh, don't need policing. McKenney says the curfew would also not stop any of the gatherings. They would just move to either private homes or properties like Le Breton Flats or along the Rideau River. Eric O'Brien, City News. City News Time 902. Vaccine safety is top of mind today after a minimal number of cases of blood clots as a side effect to a couple of COVID vaccines happen in both Canada and the United States. Updated vaccine safety information is expected from Health Canada today. In the race to get shots into arms as highly contagious variants increase the urgency. Hundreds of thousands of AstraZeneca shots have already been administered across the country with only one incident of a vaccine-related blood clot reported so far involving a woman in Quebec who's now recovering. Rare blood clot concerns in a half a dozen women also triggered the temporary pause of the one-dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine stateside, where almost 7 million people have already had that shot. The CDC is calling an emergency meeting today to review it. Dr. Anthony Fauci on the next steps. They might modify the population who gets the vaccine, depending upon what their determination is. The first Johnson & Johnson shots are expected to arrive in Canada at the end of this month. 10 million doses have been ordered. Johnson & Johnson is delaying the rollout of its vaccine in Europe and pausing all clinical trials. I'm Jamie Pulfer. City News Time 9.03. An update to a story from earlier this morning. Coast Guard in Louisiana says six people have now been rescued from a commercial vessel that capsized off the Louisiana coast and the search continues for more. At least a dozen others are listed right now as missing. The U.S. Coast Guard says two of its ships and several other boats responded to calls for help as a microburst hit the area. Wind and rough seas flipped the Sea core power. It's a huge lift boat that drops legs to the sea floor to build platforms. I'm Andrew Boyle. For News Anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's got the news and the views. He's got views on the news. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. Are we doing enough, going far enough, being tough enough, taking it seriously enough, containing the spread of COVID-19?
That's still the big question a lot of people in political office are struggling to answer. Good morning. Welcome to the Rob Snow Show on City News. Great program ahead for you. Uh, Restrictions, third wave, COVID-19. Here in Ottawa, across the province, across the country, that's what we're into today. There isn't a, a part of the country, it seems to me, when you take a deep dive into the news all across the country, there's not a part of the country where health officials and politicians aren't huddled together. And they're talking about restrictions. They're talking about tightening things down. Even more than they are now. From British Columbia to the Atlantic bubble and just about everywhere in between, I think it's the story of midweek. The third wave is raging. Hospitals are teetering. The daily number of both cases and deaths climbing, and they've been climbing for weeks. And that is despite all the restrictions that are in effect right now. And locally, all news is local. All news is local. This is going to play itself out in our city today. Restrictions, okay? City council meeting today. And one of the things that could be in the mix is a curfew for the city's parks. This has become a a hot issue this week because the nice weather is here. It was a long winter. People want to get outside, right? A lot of people don't have backyards, front yards. A lot of people don't have patios. And the park is, is it. And the parks have been, they've been busy. They've been packed. And uh, there have been some problems. People uh, drinking, party, partying in the parks until the wee hours. They're leaving their litter behind, fistfights, a stabbing. So the mayor, uh, Jim Watson, told the media this week, He wants a curfew in all the city's parks of 8 p.m. It's 11 p.m. right now. There is a curfew right now, but he wants it lowered to to, to 8 p.m. And an earlier curfew, 8 p.m. And he's the mayor. So it's likely, I think, there could be, by the end of business today, if not by the weekend, there's going to be a a curfew in effect for the city's parks of 8 instead of 11 p.m. And I want to know what you think about that. I want to know if you if you think that would be a, a move in the right direction. Does it go too far? It doesn't go far enough. It, does it go far enough, given the severity of the situation right now? Why stop there? I'm just going to float this out there. I'm curious to see what kind of response I get today. Why stop there? with an 8 p.m. curfew just in the parks. Why not an 8 p.m. curfew all across the city? Or all across the province? They've been doing this on the Quebec side. You're not allowed, you're not allowed out of the house after eight o'clock at night. Unless you have a really good reason, unless you're an essential worker. And if the cops catch you outside between or before 5 a.m. in the morning and after 8 p.m. at night, the, the, the chances are very good you're going to get a ticket. And the, it's a hefty fine, 1500 bucks. Should we do that here? Should we do that here? Given the severity of the situation now, it's as, it, it, has, it is as bad as it has ever been, ladies and gentlemen. It is as bad as it's ever been. I've heard it said already this week here on the Rob Snow Show, look, you have a curfew and um, you know who's having the illegal house parties. You know who's having the illegal gatherings because your streets will be empty. After 8 o'clock, you have a curfew in the city. So I'm putting that to you today. Okay, During our talkback hour, since there's a push on, uh, there's a push on to at least have a debate about a curfew in the parks during the city council today, which is no guarantee. 
Our colleagues at Rogers Television, by the way, they're going to carry the city council meeting for you. If you're curious about what's going on with city affairs, they'll have that for you in its entirety starting at 10 o'clock. We know that there are five councillors. They've all signed a letter. They want it to at least have the council debate it during the meeting today. No guarantee that that's going to happen. Uh, those councillors are McKenney, Flurry, King, Leeper, and Menard, we, you know, the lefties. Councillor Brockington uh, was on my program yesterday. He wants some, some kind of restrictions in the parks. Mooney's Bay is in his ward. I think Vincent Massey Park is in his ward too. He said on the show yesterday, look, something needs to be done. But a curfew in the parks, I mean, is that all that needs to be done? Given the situation with health care in the city, with our hospitals, Alex Munter is going to be on our program today, CEO of CHEO. Adults being admitted to CHEO for the first time ever. More and more admissions to hospital because of COVID. More and more people in ICU. Ottawa hospitals accepting patients from hospitals in the GTA. Case counts hovering around 200 a day. The so-called R number. Reproductive number. The reproductive rate of the virus. The experts want it desperately to be below one. The virus will not go away until that number drops below one. I looked it up this morning. You can look it up as well. It's right there. If you Google Ottawa Public Health COVID-19 dashboard pops right up. The latest R number is in excess of 1.3, which I have been told, look, I'm no expert in this stuff, but I have been told that is the danger zone because you get exponential growth with a number like that. So, closing the parks is more half measures? Is that, is that really enough? Or should we be doing more than just thinking about closing parks? And maybe we should be thinking about closing the city at night. I just want to see what kind of reaction I get. What, you know, is this something you're open to considering or is it going to meet a lot of resistance? I'm, 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 I'm curious to find out. I mean things like travel restrictions, police back on the interprovincial bridges. You know, they have a curfew over there. Let's do the same thing here. It's a, it's a stay at home order. Does it seem to be working? Because for the most part, it's voluntary. Well, maybe some are saying now this is what the, the, the buzz is. Maybe it shouldn't be voluntary anymore given the gravity of the situation. Maybe stay at home should not only be imposed, but it should be enforced, rigorously enforced. What do you think? Okay. This is why we do the talk back hour every morning for issues just like that between 10 and 11 every morning. We open the phone lines. We take your calls. We gather your opinions. We read your emails. At 750-1310-750-1310-613-750-1310, email address the Rob Snow Show at ottawa.citynews.ca. What do you think of a curfew? 8 o'clock for the city's parks. There is a curfew right now. It's 11 o'clock. A minority of people have been misbehaving. Should we punish everyone and have an 8 o'clock curfew in the city's parks? And what do you think <laughs> about a curfew for the entire city? Heck, even the entire province. You know, I'm, I was looking through the city's orders right now with this stay-at-home order in effect. It says... Stay at home unless it is essential. Going to work, going for groceries, going to a doctor's appointment, or getting some exercise. 
but it's all voluntary. Should it be anymore? There is nothing stopping me from going to the grocery store in Brockville seven days a week if I want to. It says, in the parks, the outdoor gathering limit is no more than five people outside of your household. Indoor social gatherings not allowed. We know they're happening, but they're not supposed to be happening. It's all complaint driven. The only way someone gets into problems with bylaws is, you know, basically if, you know, the neighbor has to rat you out. And a lot of people, uh, well, they've been ratting their neighbors out. (laughs) 400 to 500 calls to bylaw this past weekend. But, you know, is it all enough or is it just more half measures given what's going on out there? Is it it time to bring the hammer down? A curfew for the parks? How about a curfew for the city? I'm just putting it out there on the Rob Snow Show on City News. Well, we all loved our rock t-shirts growing up, right? It was our badge that, hey, we went to this concert. We knew that band inside out. So we, we kept doing that and kept promoting that. What's, what's sort of happening now is that audience is dying. <laughs> I always say the earth is flat. <laughs> so the 60s rockers are falling off the end of the earth. So you don't see as big a sales anymore because my audience is disappearing. What's sort of helping uh, to promote that history is the kids are buying vinyl. And luckily we have a vinyl shop in the neighborhood here, uh, Record Center. So what's happening is I've seen kids come in with their dad. And the dad said, hey, do you have any Beatle shirts? Do you have any CBGB? Do you have any of this? I said, well, why? Uh, you know, he said, well, because my daughter's into it. She's wearing my T-shirt. So slowly it's coming back, right? The kids are, I think, getting fed up with the generic music that's out there. And they want to click into something that, first of all, links them to their parents, something that they uh, thoroughly enjoy now. And maybe they're passing it on to their grandkids pandemic has been a couple of things definitely hard on everybody so much uh, uh, messaging that's out there that people don't understand stats every day Jesus Murphy like I'm getting a headache just reading this stuff right so so really it was just trying to understand where we were going to go from there the city of Ottawa all of a sudden said everybody's got to wear a mask you got to wear it on the bus people were scrambling okay and I had uh, the store next door had really big windows, so I just flooded the window with masks. Well, that was the, the activity that saved the business. Uh, people were coming in buying two, three, four masks at a time at 20 bucks a pop here. <laughs> but my masks were so different. They were the Rolling Stones, Beatles, Queen, all the pop culture. Everything else out there was medical masks. <laughs> And right, so people say, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to show my rock and roll. So it became the new, the new T-shirt, as far as I'm concerned. Well, what I've done, I'm Hintonburg. I'm at now at uh, 1114A Wellington Street, which is next door to the Fab Gear Store. And the reason I've changed names, I've rebranded the store, is because I was planning on retiring. And, and in December, I went, oh, I'm not going to retire, but I've committed to changing what the store is about. So I came up with a new name, Fab Gears Rock Shop, where legends are dressed, <laughs> and essentially get that message out. I prefer if the shirt don't fit, you come in, you try another one on. People like to feel the fabrics with clothing. It's amazing. You all come in and go, oh, I love that. Oh, can I try this? So that's the big difference. I'm not out to make a gazillion dollars. I stick the way I am, old school. I take cash, we take cards. Come on in and talk to the owner. He's a pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. Like I said, we have some great guests coming up on our program today. Alex Munter, CEO of CHEO, accepting adult patients for the first time in that hospital's 47-year history. That's coming up um, a little later in the program. Uh, Valley View, Bruce McIntyre of the Eganville Leader is going to join us. One of the stories we're going to talk about um, is the, the 
And I'm like, well, one, it's one of these stories today in insane real estate news. Um, a farmhouse in Renfrew. <laughs> uh, we had this story a few days ago. It's in the uh, real estate section of the Globe and Mail. Farmhouse in Renfrew, built in 1850 originally. Very nice looking house. Um, it sold in the year 2000 for 250 grand. It was recently listed for $1.49 million dollars. And it sold for $2.61 million. $1,115,000 over the asking price. Over the asking price. I mean, nice house, nice house. Five bedrooms, four bathrooms, 20 acres, 1,500 feet of uh, waterfront on the Ottawa River. 4420 River Road, Renfrew, Ontario. Bidders from all across Canada. The buyer's local. $1.1 million. Over the asking price. In Renfrew, okay, not New York City, in Renfrew, in Ren not Vancouver, Renfrew, Ontario. So <laughs> that's coming up a little bit later in the program. But right now we're going to talk about risk. Risk with vaccines. And what really is the risk of getting a blood clot? Be, be, if you take the AstraZeneca vaccine or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, we know there's a risk with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, the FDA and the CDC said as much yesterday. But how risky is it? What's riskier? Not getting a shot because of the news about blood clots, you're afraid about blood clots, or getting COVID-19 because you turned down a vaccine. Joining us right now to discuss this is uh, Dr. Uh, Suman Chakrabarty, Infectious Disease Specialist, Trillium Health Partners in Mississauga. Good morning, doctor. Welcome back. Good morning. Great to be back. How risky uh, is, is it with, with blood clots related to these vaccines? Yeah, How this has you, obviously yeah. been on uh, all of our minds for the last uh, uh, month or so with AstraZeneca, and now we're looking at it with Johnson & Johnson. Uh, the risk is very, very low. Uh, and I think overall for the average person getting the vaccine, uh, that's what we should remember. But that said, this is the reason why we monitor things after uh, any kind of uh, product has been put onto the market. These really rare side effects need to be looked at. They definitely need to be considered of why this is happening, who this is happening to. And then we do exactly what you were suggesting before, a risk benefit analysis and then you can make your choice and for the vast majority of people the vaccine is still very safe uh, especially given that you, you can get a, a pretty big chance of getting a clot with COVID itself. Yeah I want, I want to get into this because I've seen a lot of things I, it's great to have you on the program you're an infectious disease specialist and uh, there are other things that are that are riskier um, put you at greater risk of getting a blood clot it would seem, than these vaccines, right? For example, people have mentioned birth control, for example, puts you at an increased risk of a blood clot. Flying on an airplane puts you at an increased risk of a blood clot. Or getting COVID-19 puts you at greater risk of a, a blood clot. All accurate, doctor? Absolutely. And the thing is that, as we know, there's nothing in life that is risk free. And this is another one of those situations. And one thing that uh, mentioned that those th three examples that you gave, it's very important to note that the risk of getting clots with those. And I'm talking about just flying on a plane. So if, uh, say a plane ride here from, to Mexico. We do it all the time before um, mm -hmm. uh, COVID happened. Your risk of getting a, a, a clot on, just sitting on a flight there is much higher, you know, degrees of magnitude higher than uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine. And, you know, no, no one's going to uh, not go on a flight because of a blood clot. And that's, I think, one of the things that we just have to consider. Okay. Is it clear at this point the link between these particular vaccines and what caused these blood clots? No. So the, no? what, what okay. is clear is that it is coming from the vaccine. There's something kind of rare happening with uh, it's uh, presumed to be from the viral vector. Both of the vaccines, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, use a, an altered version of, an, uh, of a cold virus to kind of help deliver the payload. That's what, what the risk looks like. This is also not your typical kind of cloud. This is more of what we call an we're thinking it's an autoimmune type of reaction where your own immune system is 
incorrectly activating, and this is resulting in the clotting cascade starting. It's very rare. We see it in other situations outside of COVID vaccines as well. But again, it's a very, very rare thing. It yeah. needs to be worked up. Right. Not a big risk for everybody else. So what would you want to um, investigate then? If there are six cases out of, say, seven million, what, what, what would you want to investigate as a, say, a clinical investigator, for example? What would you, you would look at, for example, their history, right? Lifestyle, um, history, um, what, what, you know, uh, risk factors for blood clots in general. Just what would you look at? Yeah, all those. So age, uh, age yeah. medical history, history of autoimmune diseases, previous clots, all those things are really important. Mm. Does it say anything to you, doctor? Uh, and I know it's kind of, it's kind of speculative right now, but the fact that it, all these cases are in women, does that uh, say anything to you? Or? Absolutely. And because you yeah? know, the, okay. the unusual clots that we see, you know, they call them the uh, cerebrosinus thrombosis, outside of COVID, this is actually something that we more, much more commonly see in young women. And it, it's uh, been associated with the birth control pill and just in women in general of childbearing age, as it's referred to. So I suspect it's something. It could be hormonal. Uh, but we also know that uh, young women can be at risk of certain autoimmune conditions over men. So that's why this is one of those things. Again, you have to really, really well characterize this. And it might end up being a situation where uh, it can be altered on who you give it to with an advisory, but overall, right, right. worldwide, it's safe. And what do you think is going to happen now uh, to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, for example? Uh, you know, the AstraZeneca vaccine is still being distributed, still being administered, albeit with these caveats, uh, revised warning labels, uh, guidance as to dosing age, uh, what have you. Do you expect the same thing to happen to Johnson & Johnson, uh, doctor? Absolutely. Important for us to kind of do the same kind of pharmacovigilance, see if there's a link. I suspect the two things will be worked up together to see if there's a common link between the two vaccines that's re resulting in this. And we may also see some interesting things in dosing changes that might mm -hmm. kind of help to avoid this, even in young women. Okay. Your advice right now would be, if you're offered this vaccine, we've ordered 38 million doses of this vaccine for Canada. A shipment of 10 million is supposed to be on the way. Um, if I'm called, it's my turn. If it's finally my turn, doctor. And, uh, you know, I go to my community center, local clinic, where, well, the pharmacy, whatever the case is, uh, and it's AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson, sh should I hesitate at all? to get this vaccine, do you think? Uh, no, I, and I understand where the, where the trepidation would come from, but kind of weighing the risks and the benefits, I would get the vaccine. We're in the middle of a pandemic, mm -hmm. the public health emergency. This is a tiny risk, one that needs to be worked up, but I think that overall the risk of not getting the vaccine is much higher than getting it. I, I would recommend, and I have recommended to my own uh, colleagues, friends, and family. Thank you, doctor, for your time this morning. Continue good health, sir. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye. Dr. Bye. Suman Chakrabarty. Infectious disease specialist, Trillium Health Partners in Mississauga. Still ahead, your political fix. Carl Belanger, president of Traxion Strategies, and Jason Leader, the president of Enterprise Canada. They are ready to go right after the news on City News.
number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Wednesday, April 14th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 12 degrees in Smith Falls right now, 11. Here's what's making news this hour. One person died in a vehicle rollover on a quiet residential street in Elmvale Acres. The fire service called to Chapman Boulevard in the smyce saint Laurent area to extricate one person from the car just before midnight last night. That person, a 37-year-old man, was pronounced dead at the scene. Now, people in that area of Ottawa say they're not surprised. Speed has been a concern in the neighbourhood. Now, police have not said if speed was a factor in this crash. A house, though, was significantly damaged when that vehicle struck it. One hot topic at Ottawa City Council today could be curfew in parks. Mayor Jim Watson vocalized that after partying over the weekend, especially in Vincent Massey Park. Five councillors have written a letter to the mayor expressing their opposition to that plan. 20% of Canadians have now received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. The pace of vaccine vaccinations is rising, but the third wave of COVID-19 is exploding. Canada now has one of the highest rates of new cases in the world and a record number of patients in critical care. In the last seven days across the country, an average of 970 people were in intensive care with COVID-19. City News Time 932. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's time to score your political fix. Joining us this morning, Carl Belanger, President of Traxion Strategies. Good morning, Carl. Good morning. Jason Leader is the printer, President of Enterprise Canada. Welcome back, Jason. Morning. So I just got a tweet from Laura Carney from 680 News, our sister station in Toronto. Catherine McKenna announces the federal government, federal government, will be investing, they never spend, they always invest, invest $525 million to make Ontario schools safer. Money will be used towards improving air quality, hand washing stations, and better physical distancing. Catherine McKenna announces $525 million to make Ontario schools safer. Now, as I understand it, it's a joint funding announcement. There's actually more than $600 million, but most of the money is federal money. But do you read anything into that, Jason Leader? Do you read anything into that? Election time, bud. Election, election time. time. That's what it says to me. Um, they're clearing the decks, right? Air Canada, school funding, trying to fix, pick, their, pick their spots. Um, School you know, funding it, it, in Ontario, battleground it, Ontario. It, right? Yeah, exactly. Listen, they they know that uh, you know parents are, are a lot of this. Uh, you know, probably some reannouncement of, of funding that's already happened. You know, for something that frankly is um you know you can't change schools that much that's the one thing i mean we could talk about this all day but the schools are schools classrooms are classrooms they do ventilation really good but you know let's, let's face it, it's not going to be done for for this for this year so this is the right, next right, year right, right. Um, problem you know well, you well, nobody knows when school's going to be back right now <laughs> exactly <laughs> trust me they're, they're not fixing the hvac systems in every school between now and uh, june but um you know listen it tells you that there's an election coming that they want an election they're trying to clear the decks um uh, it's a smart political move by the federal government, okay. knowing the parents are, are, are sort of wondering and you're going to see the press release say, oh, somebody's doing something. Um, a lot of this work was done um, back in the fall, hundreds of millions of dollars, but it's a very smart political move and it tells me uh, they want to call an election very soon. Smart political move. Carl Belanger, do you agree? Smart political move. Well, I mean, it's smart communication strategy for sure, uh, but what does it really mean? I mean, it, it's feels to me like this is basically Ontario's share of the $2 billion that uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced last summer for the Safe Return to Class Fund. Uh, and so this is basically the money finally trickling in to the Ontario system. Uh, and that's one of the things that the Auditor General complained about. Like All these programs are announced and the money takes forever to get to where it's needed. Mm. And perhaps if that money had been invested when the fund was announced back in August, uh, Ontario would not have had to close their schools this spring. And same goes for Quebec. Uh, so, you know, I mean, it's nice to have these funds announced. It's better when they actually flow through. 
Okay. The first budget from the Trudeau government since its re-election in 2019 will come out on Monday. Uh, Jason, what do you expect? What should Canadians expect? What do you expect? Well, um, I think they're going to, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to spend, it's not going to be a fiscally, res- there's not going to be a lot of fiscal restraint here. <laughs> Rob, let's start there. Okay. Right, like that's, this is not going to be a penny-pinching uh, budget. No, uh, no. This is going to be a chicken in every pot. This is, uh, you know, child care. They're, they're telling everybody and their dog that they're going to do a big uh, a, j- a big child care program. Um, I think that's probably the case. Uh, you can see, listen, they've spent so much money. And I, there's not necessarily a criticism. I'm just saying they've spent so much Weren't money. we all going to the prom when they first promised uh, uh, to do child care in a big way? The Liberals? Uh, prom. Uh, we were, I, was, I, was, I was in diapers, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's well, okay. really, Maybe Jason's not as old thing, as right? I am. Okay, sorry. But. New pharmacare, more child care, you know, some other stuff. Uh, no, here's the thing. Um, you know, they're, um, they, we were supposed to be going to parks this last summer too. Don't forget, they were going to give us two thousand bucks to go to parks when they're in their in their election campaign as well, Rob. But I, you know, I, I guess that dream's over. Listen, this is going to be a big spending budget. Um, they're going to promise everything. It's going to be an election sort of pamphlet. Um, whether or not they go in the spring or the fall, this is the roadmap for what they're going to do. Um, you see, Christian Freeland. Yeah, I think you're going to see corporate tax hikes. Um, so, you know, the sort of the rich need to pay for all this is going to be the, uh, the, the sort of underlying message of a lot of the, how you're going to pay for this. Right. So I think they, she signed on to the, um, the Americans pledge to, re, to, re, um, uh, heighten or increase corporate tax rates. That's going to be a centerpiece of this budget. So it's not going to be like, we're embarrassed to do it. We're excited that Fire. corporations, big business are going to do this. The problem is a lot of small businesses pay those corporate tax taxes as well. I mean, you're really only 500,000 or a million dollars in, in income or and you and you have to pay those 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 rates. So it's going to be a hit on small and medium sized business for sure. But that's going to be what this budget is about: childcare and raising corporate tax rates. Yeah, and I think uh, the UK ju- uh, just raised its corporate tax rate by the most in I believe it was twenty or thirty years. And we know Biden is is planning to do the same. So the table is kind of set there already for them to do that. What what, uh, what do you think? What are you anticipating from the budget on Monday, Carl? Yeah, well, I think Jason is right. Uh, It's kind of a, we are in a political era where uh, people have seen the deficit balloon to $400 billion and they don't flinch. They, in fact, don't care. Uh, So the liberals will take that that as a window of opportunity to uh, go all in and and perhaps for the first time deliver on some of their long-standing promises such as child care and national pharma care, uh, things that uh, they failed to deliver while they were in power and clearly were, uh, the problem linked to the fact that they did not deliver were highlighted during this pandemic when it comes to child care, when it comes to pharma care, when it comes to distribution system. So, uh, of course, it's a, w- a window of political opportunity for them and they'll make the most of it now when it comes to paying for it i think they will align with the rest of the g7 and the g20 and there's a return of the pendulum after decades of corporate tax cuts um how, how far will they go remains to be seen uh, considering that the liberals decided to vote against uh the kind of measures the any people that voted for during their own convention last week in terms of making the rich pay uh, shows that they're not willing to go all in on that front. Do you think there'll be anything that looks like a basic income in there? No. No? I don't. No? You don't? Really? No, the okay. PM looks lukewarm. No. Yeah. Yeah. Warm. I think I think he's actually caught the mood right on that. I mean, okay. regardless of what we think about the policy, Carl and I might disagree, but I think there's probably uh, not an appetite for a lot of middle class taxpayers to see that come right now. I think he's probably caught the mood right on that. I mean, the, the opportunity for that was the CERB, right? You right, could have made right. it universal. You could have made it so that everyone get a check and then you can claw it back at income tax time. Uh, instead, they went with a different model. So why would they suddenly reverse themselves? and go for, uh, you know, universal income benefit at this time. It doesn't make sense. And, and just, just Justin Trudeau's body language on that yesterday when answering questions was quite telling. How likely is it that this is the budget that sends us to the polls? Well, um, I don't know that the government will fall on the budget, but okay. we'll certainly use it as the electoral platform that it needs. Okay. Do you agree yeah, with that? Uh, my, I haven't changed on this either, Rob. Like they, yeah, okay. they, they, they're not going to fall on the on the on the budget folks. The, the opposition parties are going right, to right, right. vote them out. But if we're not in an election, 
by mid May, um, I'll be surprised. By mid May, wow! Like in a month from now. Yeah. In a month from now. Okay. Well, a recent poll by Ipsos and Global News has the Liberal Party at the forty percent mark. I, you know, when you look at that forty percent, I mean. Can he really resist the temptation to hold an election if you're at 40% in the polls, right? Right, Jason? I mean, how do you he, resist he, that? He right? That's when you he, go, he right? That's when you yeah. go, right? Yeah. He's in politics. Uh, you know, the truth is he'll, right. probably, he'll probably win. And it has nothing to do with anything Jagmeet Singh or Aaron O'Toole or, uh, you know, anybody else does about it. He's probably going to win if he goes this spring. And, uh, you know, I've been around a lot of leaders and a uh, prime minister or two, and most often they look across the table and say, can I do it? And if the answer is yes, they usually go. And I think he's beaten himself up for not having gone last fall. Right. Well, what do you think, Carl? Can you, can, I mean, if you, can you possibly resist being at 40% in the polls? Um, well, I mean, it's one poll. There are well, other polls that are showing it a little closer. Right. Uh, but uh, I think the key, the key factor is the vaccination rollout. Still, uh, we saw in Ontario... Uh, yesterday, tens, tens of thousands of appointments being cancelled because of the uh, lack of supplies. Um, and there's, there are issues elsewhere in the country, and the third wave is still uh, rising. Um, so, so it, that needs to be curbed down if if he if he wants to avoid any kind of backlash or, or things that he cannot control during an election because he's too busy campaigning. So that's the danger, and and I think that that. That's the reason why we won't see an election this spring. We will wait till the end of the summer. Till the end of the summer. Till the end of the summer. Okay. Jason uh, described the Air Canada bailout as kind of like one more thing on the list. This is something we have to get done. What what was your reaction, uh, Carl, to the Air Canada bailout? How do, how do you read that? Well, uh, I think that the federal government uh, waited a long time to deliver this bailout, and it's probably because Air Canada was not willing to move on the few conditions that the federal government had. Uh, so now we are all, all of us, our owners, <laughs> shareholders of, of uh, Air Canada, yeah. uh, with possibility of increasing our stake, and, and there are some conditions set, which I think politically made sense, uh, like limiting the uh, salaries of the top executives to $1 million like it was indecent to see these companies ask for federal bailout while they were making millions and millions of dollars in compensation on top of stock options. Yeah. Uh, so plus so, they're trying to buy other companies. I mean, Air Canada well, that's was good uh, you know saying bail us out, bail us out, bail us out. But oh, by the way, we're trying to buy our you know nobody rival. Wants to, nobody wants we're trying to, to buy Air Transat <laughs> right now. We're trying to buy Air Transat. Yeah, and on top of that, of course, holding the money uh, owed to right, customers right, to, yeah. to stay afloat. So now that condition has been met. So so uh, I think you know. It, took a long time, it took probably too long, but in the end, those who uh, didn't die over the last year and can, can use the credit uh, or get the refund will, will benefit from that, and that's good news. Now I'm wondering what's going to happen with the other airlines who are, are also in trouble and uh, also have customers that are waiting for their money back. Right, right. Okay. What about, what about this issue of the, the Airbus formerly known as Bombardier airplanes, uh, 33 of them that are being built at Mirabel. This is the C-Series jets. They're, it's called the A220 now, after Bombardier got out of that business. Uh, built in Mar- Mirabel, and the government said you have to buy all 33 of those planes and they have to be built in Mirabel. You think that had anything to do with it? <laughs> two bailouts, one 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 check, two bailouts, right? Uh, you, okay. get, you get more right. more for your yeah. money here. It's a, like a sale on airlines and and Quebec and infrastructure. It, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's terrific. No, we we laugh about you know child care. It's you know every spring rolls around and the liberals promise child care and there's a Bombardier bailout like yeah. you know something. Yeah, it's just it's just you say. I mean, we're talking about three billion dollars worth of airplanes. One there. of the first okay. signs of spring. You know, we get so excited about spring. It's just you know you get excited, Rob. Uh, hey, listen. 
they they did what they, they they needed to do, and it just tells you it backs up sort of what we were all talking about earlier. Whether the election is this spring or this fall, they are clear in the decks, man. And the Quebec decks. is number one. It's the route to a majority government for Mr. Trudeau. Um, you're going to hear be hearing a lot about Quebec. You're going to be hearing him speak French a lot more than you normally do. Oh. Um, you know, and uh, he's fighting the Bloc Québécois, uh, and he's fighting the NDP, and he's fighting the Conservatives in some ridings. But he is focused squarely on Quebec and the 905. Okay, I'd love, I'd love to have Carl's. I'd love to have Carl take on that, but we'll have to wait until we come back with part two of your political fix here on City News. So Rideau Rockcliffe Community Resource Centre has been around since 1982 and it's here to serve residents um, of Ward 13. Um, so our focus is on um, helping to reduce uh, poverty in this community as well as empowering uh, residents to find uh, resilience within themselves. Um, so one of the, the new focuses of our centre is around food programming. Um, so you'll notice today when we, when we go around on a little tour um, that we have a number of, a number of food programs here at the center. So one being obviously our emergency uh, food program, um, which is really great. So residents can come and um, access food when they are in need. We also have a number of food-based social enterprises uh, here at Rideau Rockcliffe as well. Um, so one being uh, the Ottawa Good Food Box, um, another being Market Mobile. One of our new initiatives that started this year as response to COVID is called Good Food on the Move, and it's a click and collect um, online store, and we have seven pickup locations uh, throughout the city. Um, more sort of local here uh, for Ward 13 residents, we've also started um, a free produce market as well. So community members can come on Wednesdays and Fridays and be able to access additional free fruits and vegetables. So Social Harvest Ottawa is one of the social enterprises here at the Rideau Rockcliffe Community Resource Centre. We operate this great urban greenhouse and our work is not only to grow nutritious and delicious food, but also to nourish communities with community members um, here in Ward 13 and beyond. The greenhouse is a year-round project. Uh, we're a team of four employees working here. Uh, we have two full-time employees and two part-time employees. We focus on growing microgreens from uh, late fall to early spring and hot, hot, hot house crops uh, in the summertime, such as uh, tomatoes and cucumbers. The Mission Food Truck has now, we're in our fifth week of uh, collaborating with them to come visit our center. And we just got in on it at the right time. They were looking for new communities to branch out to. They said, absolutely. Right now they're funded through donations. They travel around Ottawa um, and, and just give out delicious, fresh, hot food um, to people as well. We have at our center the Ottawa Good Food Box, um, as well as the Market Mobile. So Ottawa Good Food Box has been around for 25 years, um, and Market Mobile is a little younger, started in 2014. So they both have the mission and the mandate of making fresh food more accessible um, and affordable in neighborhoods that lack access to, an, to a grocery store. So I think the, the greatest need that we've seen as a result of the pandemic in our um, community is, is people that we maybe have never needed to access our services um, before, right? So a lot of people have had um, you know layoffs um, you know maybe they're just not able to work because they have to stay home with their with their children you know over the summer that sort of thing so we we've definitely seen um, the need uh, go out particularly for our, our food programming as well as some of our counseling um, services as well so it's you know it's it's a heavy time for people emotionally Strong opinions. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. We're back talking political strategy. Carl Balanze from Traction. Jason Leader from Enterprise. Uh, so Jason mentioned before the break, Carl, that uh, he anticipates the hearing the Prime Minister a lot more in French. It sounds like it's going to be uh, re really battleground Quebec as much as anything in, in this election. I know we talked about this last week. Do you agree with that, or two weeks ago? Do you agree with that assessment, uh, Carl? Yeah. Well, yes, uh, in as much that uh, his capacity to make ground elsewhere, to make ground elsewhere is limited if he starts losing seats in Quebec in a significant fashion. So uh, the fact that the Liberals in the Bloc Québécois are neck and neck in the polls in Quebec uh, is a pretty good situation for the federal Liberals, but it needs to remain that way. And, and this is why it's not surprising to see Justin Trudeau from time to time. 
standing up for Quebec, uh, going uh, going after people who are uh, going uh, with the practice of Quebec bashing. Uh, those are words that Justin Trudeau was not using in the past, and there's a reason for it, and that reason is the Quebec seats that are in play. Yeah, uh, there are rumors that this bailout of Air Canada may be, and, and as I mentioned, the Airbus aircraft, Bombardier aircraft, Mirabel airport, uh, this kind of stuff, is why the, the bloc may have agreed to um, end the inquiry into the government's handling of sexual misconduct allegations in the military. Could one thing, Carl, have anything to do with the other? Do you think this was some kind of backroom deal? Um. I mean, if it is, it'd be an odd one, uh, okay. because uh, where's the credit? <laughs> if okay. the Bloc Québécois managed to get that concession for the government, right. where do they get credit? Okay. Uh, and if it's an exchange with um, <clears throat> shutting down an investigation into sexual uh, incongruent in and allegations against uh, uh, the, the, the top brass of the <laughs> armed forces, <laughs> right, right. Uh, it seems to it seems pretty crass, right? Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and and it doesn't it make you wonder why? Why did the bloc agree to do that? Though? Well, I'm, I've been wondering that, and the explanation by the bloc that uh, we needed to act fast because June is coming and we need a report out uh, falls short. So, so if that's the reason, um, it's it's very strange. It's weird calculation because you cannot claim credit for that deal unless you throw the victims under the bus. Okay. What do you think about that, Carl? It, it, you know, the, the, the block siding with the liberals and ending that inquiry into the into sexual assault allegations in the military. You're asking me, um, yeah. Mira? Uh, sorry, Jason. Yeah, uh, Jason. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I was baffled. So, first yeah. of all, you know, we've got a, quote, feminist government, you know, quote, because it's 2015, because, you know, hashtag believe women, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and yeah, I guess that the, this is a political problem for them. Um, uh, you know, the minister and the prime minister, probably they should have done something a lot sooner when they found out that this was sort of an issue. I mean, you heard my former boss, you know, uh, and, and, and my, my, my former colleagues, Ray Novak, in front of the committee sort of saying, yeah, we heard these rumors. We asked them about it. This is what they said. You know, they should have followed up. Um, but so I understand that it's messy. But to, to sort of have this pervasive sexual harassment culture inside the military, which seems to be relatively well known and not have done anything about it. And then to shut down the inquiry. Um, and then for, I, 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 just, I couldn't tell you, I can't tell you why the block um, agreed to this. I just, I can't understand it at all. And then Carl hit the nail on the head. If it's a deal, it's either the stupidest or the, you know, like it doesn't make any sense. They don't okay. get any credit for the Air Canada thing. Right. The liberals will get credit for the Air Canada thing. Yep. So why would the block ever agree to a deal like that? It just, it's, it's a non sensical um, sort of, uh, you know, agreement. And, you know, if you're in opposition and, and you're in Quebec and you're the Bloc Québécois, why wouldn't you hold their feet to the fire? It's, uh, I don't know if it All was right. sloppy. I, 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 I suspect that there's not as, as not, it's not as tidy a, uh, an explanation as the one that we're talking about. And it's probably yeah. a little bit of incompetence on the Bloc's behalf, to be honest. Yeah. So the CBC reports today this. Uh, Jason, if an election in Alberta were held today, the NDP, the NDP would likely win a majority as support for the governing United Conservative Party plummets, according to a new poll commissioned by CBC News. Um, you've often said on this program, Jason, this is wartime and people rally behind their leaders at wartime. And we, you know, we've seen, uh, despite fumbled response to, to the to the pandemic, whether it's you know Doug Ford or or Premier Horgan, Premier Legault, Justin Trudeau, they're all doing pretty well in the polls. Jason Kenney is the exception. What's going on here? Could he be a one-term wonder? <laughs> it's possible. I mean, oh, he's got his work yeah. cut out for him. He's got his work cut out for him. Um, I'm, a, I'm yeah. First of all, you know, sort of full disclosure, I'm a I'm a good good friend of Jason Kenney's. I know him. I, I've known him for a long time, and I, I hope he wins that election. Um, uh, but I will say this: at the end of the last campaign. So people wanted in Alberta wanted to return to conservative government, but they didn't mind Rachel Notley, right? Like there was there was this sort of view of the world that, you know, man, if she was like if she were a federal liberal, for example, I think she'd be pretty easily electable in some of those in some of those areas. Okay. And 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 people generally and 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 she did 
the, a really smart thing politically. Like, I don't know if it was a good thing for her personal life, but staying in politics politically for her was a really good thing. Because the truth is, they'd have no chance. The NDP would have no chance um, if she weren't if she weren't around. She's a, a known brand, and she's done a pretty good job in opposition. And the truth is, they've been relentless. And the other thing, I, I don't like to blame or like I'm not blaming the media. I would just say that this. I, my experience with the uh, sort of Edmonton press gallery is is they are very, very they're they're not fans of Jason Kenny. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and <laughs> so you've got this sort of relentless push. You've got a few self right. you know self inflicted right. wounds. Um, it'll get close. Like that's going to be a close election when it, wow. when it actually if and when it actually gets called. I think the NDP does have a chance. I think the Conservatives probably squeak through. But uh, Mr. Kenny, uh, you know he's the thing about Mr. Kenny is he's one of the best cabinet ministers. I've I've ever seen. He's an unbelievable. So the things that are make him really good at politics, which are unbelievable, sort of, um, you know, sort of work ethic, uh, ability to understand complex things and simplify them, um, to make sort of the right policy decisions. For example, our immigration. Those are the things that are re- make him really good at politics. The thing that it, he's not the best at of politics is relating to an audience because he's just he's just a different kind of guy, and that's what hamstrings him in this kind of a thing. When somebody like Ford, for example. He makes mistakes, but man, you can tell he cares. You know, it's what the right, difference. Okay. And his strengths okay. are not what has been sort of valued over the last year. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Carl, what do you think? Jason Kenny, the one term wonder. It's the return of Premier Notley if the election were held today in Alberta. What do you think is going on there? Well, I think it's quite possible. And to pick up on your war analogy, uh, I think there's a perception that Jason Kenny didn't want to go to war and that he doesn't have a disciplined army behind him and we saw it last week when the 17 MLAs came out against the measures his government is pushing and and uh, you know so you are going against the message of your government and you're undermining at the same time this public safe safety measures and the chances of government to be reelected. Um, and the other the flip side of that is Jason is, is absolutely bang on. Rachel Notley is an old brand. She's a well-liked brand. She has also established that uh, despite the hiccups and the problems and, and some of the discontent, the end, an NDP government in Alberta was not the end of the world. It was not the apocalypse that was predicted. It is an alternative to the governing party, uh, which has traditionally been the Conservative Party in, in Alberta. Uh, that's been established. So if people are upset, they're not worried to go elsewhere this time, right? They're not right, worried right. to change because okay. they've seen it in action and the, the sky didn't fall. Okay. A very interesting discussion, as always, with both of you this week. I greatly appreciate it. Stay well. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, thanks see you, again. See you, Rob. See you, Carl. Yeah. Bye. Carl Belanger from Traxion Strategies, Jason Leader from Enterprise. I'm Rob Snow, Rob Snow Show. Talk back hour coming up, 750-1310. On tap for today, question for today. What do you think of rolling back the curfew for the park? This program is brought to you by Ignite TV.